During wartime, important emergency services are typically stretched thin. With so many soldiers and civilians alike facing the horrors of war, it makes it impossible for police officers, firefighters, or paramedics to help everyone. And what's typically coupled with the lack of emergency services is the lack of access to public utilities like water, electricity, and gas. This leaves many civilians vulnerable to harm, and not just from enemy soldiers, but their fellow countrymen as well. These people take advantage of the lack of emergency services and the lack of access to public utilities like electricity. This video will cover these three soldiers who decided to use the cover of the night and the unfortunate circumstances that were caused by war in order to kill innocent women. This is Edward Joseph Leonsky, born December 12, 1917. He was the sixth child of Russian Jewish immigrants John Leonsky and his wife Amelia. He was born in New Jersey. While growing up there, his home life wasn't ideal. His parents were abusive, and his brother was committed to a mental institution as a result of that abuse. And in order to escape this violence, Eddie decided to join the U.S. Army in February of 1941. After he completed basic training, he was shipped off to Melbourne, Australia, where he and many other U.S. servicemen weren't welcomed. During the early 40s, the Labor Party in Australia shared their worries about American servicemen entering their nation. With an emphasis on African American servicemen, they were afraid that they would be rowdy and that they would disobey local laws in Melbourne. These fears also excluded to sexual competition. A lot of the women in Melbourne were dating American servicemen, and this was viewed as incredibly embarrassing for Australian men, and this added to the xenophobia against white and black soldiers stationing in Australia and living in Melbourne. And this is important to note, because once Edward Leonsky arrived in Australia, he already had a magnifying glass placed on him. His actions were monitored, and his presence was unwanted. These circumstances may be the reason why Eddie decided to commit his egregious acts against women at night, specifically during brownouts, when nobody would be outside. Eddie's father, Joseph, was an abusive alcoholic, and this behavior rubbed off on Eddie. He liked to get drunk in bars and then have fist fights with whoever was nearby. He would typically go to the bar around 10.30 p.m. because that's when he would complete his work at Camp Bell Military Base. And on the evening of May 2nd, 1941, Eddie, attempting to go home after going to the bar, met a woman named Ivy McLloyd. She had recently divorced her husband and was attempting to get her life back in order. During a brief conversation between him and Ivy, Eddie decided to strangle her to death. And once he was done, he stripped her half naked and positioned her body in a degrading position and then fled the scene. When the police found her body the next morning, they found that she still had her purse, which meant Eddie's intentions was not to rob the woman, but to simply kill and degrade her. Approximately six days later, Eddie decided to get drunk again at a different bar drinking gin. But this time, he wasn't alone. He was sharing a drink with a woman named Pauline Thompson, a talented singer who had come to Melbourne to perform for the troops. They shared a pleasant conversation, and at the end of the night, Eddie requested a goodbye kiss, and as Pauline leaned forward, Eddie grabbed her throat and strangled her to death as well. This murder was unique because there was a witness. Pauline Thompson, before she was murdered, was seen in company with a man who had an American accent, and the Melbourne police quickly put together a profile, and this profile was released to the public. A white male American soldier is potentially the suspect of multiple murders. The female citizens of Melbourne were frightened. They were quoted saying, I work in the city. I see American soldiers literally every day of my life. The murderer could have been anyone, and Eddie was taking advantage of the periodical brownouts in Melbourne, places in the city that temporarily didn't have electricity, therefore no lights. Gladys Hosking, 40, was the next and final victim. Eddie was able to ambush her and attack her while she was walking back home from her work at the chemistry department in the University of Melbourne. But this attack wasn't easy. Gladys Hosking put up a fight and was able to exhaust Eddie before she was murdered. Eddie, on his way back from the murder scene, asked many individuals on the street for directions back to the military base. His uniform was covered in mud, and his breathing was labored. People thought this was very suspicious and alerted the police to his description. And it wouldn't be long that the police would match his description to descriptions of other crimes committed in Melbourne with women who survived their attacks. The surviving victims and other witnesses were able to easily pick Eddie out of a lineup and he was subsequently charged with three counts of murder. The trial was quick because Eddie admitted to the crimes. 
Reporters of that time noted that Eddie had no personal connections to any other women in his life. He had some tenuous connections with men, but he was pretty much a loner, and after he was found guilty of these crimes, he was sentenced to death by a general court-martial on July 17, 1942. This is Paul Orgzow, born September 29, 1912. His home life was tumultuous. Born in the town of Muntaunen, East Prussia in the German Empire, he was the illegitimate son of Mari Saga, a farm worker, and he was immediately put up for adoption. He would eventually be adopted by John Orgzow and quickly be moved to Berlin. His adoptive father was a steel worker, and his wages supported him and Paul. That would be until he turned 18 and needed to find a job so he decided to join the National Socialist Party in 1931. He would quickly climb the ranks and acquire any job that was available, and by 1933, the highest position he's ever earned was secured. He was one of many high-ranking officials within the party's paramilitary branch, and as a result, he was given even more responsibilities, one being a plate layer for the Deschutz Reichsbahn, otherwise known as the German National Railroad. This would be his main role all the way up until he was arrested. But being a high-ranking party member wasn't his only notable quality. He was also known as a domestic abuser. Although he beat his wife consistently, he was a relatively kind father to his children, and he was moderately present in their lives, mostly because he was preoccupied doing something else. Paul, during his free time, acknowledged and took note of the fact that many housewives in the area that he was living were alone. Their husbands were recently sent off to war, and Paul saw this as an opportunity to act out some of his demented fantasies. In late 1939, while he and his family were residing in Karlhost, Orgsau attacked, physically assaulted, and forced himself upon dozens of women who resided in the Friedrichsfeld district. In total, there were 31 cases of assault placed against him in this one district. He would typically threaten his victims with a knife or physically assault them by choking them. It wouldn't be until October 4th, 1940, for him to commit his first murder. Paul would break into the house of a 20-year-old mother of two, Gertrude Ditter, whose husband was in the military. She was quickly ambushed and stabbed to death. Two months later, on the evening of December 4th, he killed two more women. He crushed the skull of an S-Bahn passenger by the name of Elfried Franke with an iron bar before hurling her corpse from the moving train. And less than an hour later, Paul met 19-year-old Imgard Fresse on the street as she was walking home and forced himself upon her before also bludgeoning her to death. Typically, when Paul would choose a victim, he would choose a victim that would be on the train line that he was managing, and once he completed his murder, he would discard the body on the train tracks. This would happen a fourth time when a fourth body was found alongside of the tracks. Her name was Elizabeth Berringer, and she had died from the result of a fractured skull. Two additional victims would be found in a similar way, their bodies being discarded on the tracks. One victim in particular survived her attack. Her name was Hedwig Ebauer, and she was five months pregnant when attacked by Paul. Paul tried to strangle her, but wasn't successful. These murders did not go unnoticed. Both the Berlin police and the SS were incredibly invested in trying to find who was responsible for these assaults and murders. The investigation was incredibly extensive. All Berlin rail workers were interviewed and investigated to determine who was potentially responsible for these victims being thrown out of the train. Unfortunately, these efforts did not bear fruit, but Paul knew about all of them because he was the manager of that railway organization, and he put his wave of assaults and murder on pause for five months until he felt comfortable to start again. His final murder was of a woman, 35 years old, named Frida Kozal. Paul forced himself upon her and then bludgeoned her to death. She was a pregnant mother of three and was killed in the exact same area where all of these crimes begun, the Friedrichsfeld district. This final murder must have given Paul an incredible amount of ego. He began to share his feelings about women a little bit more liberally. Many railway workers and party members identified him as a misogynist, specifically his fascination with killing women. It wouldn't be long until both the Berlin police and the SS acknowledged the connection between Paul's thoughts about women and the women found on his rail line. He would soon be arrested and Paul confessed to all of his crimes. He specifically pleaded guilty to eight murders, six attempted murders, 31 cases of assault, which included sexual assault. He was subsequently sentenced to death, and on July 26, 1941, he was executed via the guillotine. This is Gordon Frederick Cummins, born 18th of February, 1914. He was born in New Earswick, located in North Yorkshire, and his childhood was relatively unremarkable. 
He was an average student in school, and at the age of 16, at the completion of his education, he received a chemistry diploma. As a result, he moved to Newcastle and briefly worked as an industrial chemist, but he was fired from his job after five months. In 1933, he would obtain more employment as a tanner in Northampton. He worked at this job for a little longer than his previous, until getting fired after 13 months. These two events put a chip on his shoulder. He wanted to be wealthy, he wanted to have a comfortable lifestyle, but he had no skills, and he certainly didn't have the intellect. So he resorted to acts of petty thievery and embezzlement in order to create a facade of wealth to impress actual wealthy people. But sporadic petty thievery isn't enough to really maintain a life. So he joined the Royal Air Force with the hopes of creating a military career. He would pass basic training and become an airman, and subsequently be sent off to war in mainland Europe. But after a while, he would be transferred back to the United Kingdom with the hopes to be trained as a fighter pilot. He always wanted to fly a Spitfire, and this dream of his became reality. Once he achieved 1,000 hours of flight time, he was transferred to Regent's Park and stationed along 300 other men, and he was ordered to report for duty at 10 a.m. on February 2nd, 1942. Like the other two monsters mentioned in this video, Gordon during his free time acknowledged a few things about his surroundings. While living in London, Gordon took note of the many blackouts that would occur, mostly due to German air raids. Gordon is known to have murdered at least four women during these blackouts. And there were a multitude of attempts that didn't go through. The first murder was committed on February 8th, 1942. The body of a 40-year-old pharmacist named Evelyn Hamilton was found face up in the gutter. Multiple fingerprints were able to be pulled off of her body. She had been strangled and beaten. Her handbag was missing 80 pounds, and she was easily identified because she was found lying next to her flashlight. The fingerprints and bruises left on her neck indicated that the strangler was left-handed. Not even a day later, another body was found. The butchered body of Evelyn Oatley was found in her bed. Her whole body was viciously slashed. Her neck and her genitals were cut. Her neck was cut with a razor, and her genitals were mutilated with a tin can opener. There was also evidence of her being assaulted with curling tongs and an electric torch. Evelyn was a free spirit. She aspired to be a movie star, and specifically during the Blitz, she never wanted to go to bed alone. She wanted to always sleep with someone. She preferred older men because she was under the impression that they were more docile. There were many witness accounts of her speaking with a man who resembled Gordon. And at the scene, her handbag was emptied, and the fingerprints on her and the handbag were from someone who was left-handed. The investigators immediately acknowledged that this was a sadistic mutilation. Gordon not only desired to cause her pain, but wanted to find the worst way possible to do it. And for every other murder, it was the same. On February 11th, a 43-year-old prostitute named Margaret Florence Lowe was strangled, beaten, assaulted, and mutilated in the same way as Evelyn Oatley. On February 12th, Doris Wanette was assaulted as well. She was strangled and her body was gruesomely mutilated. Fortunately, during this killing spree, Gordon was sloppy. He left key evidence at every crime scene, and during his final attempt to murder, assault, and mutilate a woman, he was caught by a police officer. He attempted to commit this crime in a relatively public space, and this decision allowed people to share their witness accounts of what happened. Unlike his terrible contemporaries, he chose to lie. He didn't want to confess to his crimes, meaning his case has to go to trial. But the police already had tons of evidence, and there were tons of witness testimony as well. He was quickly found guilty of murder and sentenced to death. And on June 25th, 1942, he took his final breath at the Wadsmouth Prison Gallows. He was hung until he was dead. I want to make it clear that these aren't the only wartime serial killers out there. There were a lot more. These three were just the most prolific. And if you want me to cover this topic again, please let me know in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like. I really enjoy covering content like this, so I hope you enjoy it too, seriously. And as always, I'll catch you guys in the next one.